How's it going, right? This is Rob Novcast back with a another video for you guys. I'm actually really excited to talk about this one because uh, this one has been, you know, making people a lot of people excited uh, for, and I gotta say I'm excited to talk about it. So Ghostbusters Afterlife. So as a brief introduction, it was directed by Jason Reitman. And written by Gil Kennan, Jason Reitman, and Dan Aykroyd. And it's based on, and I'm sure this will probably be an iffy, iffy situation depending on uh, who you are. Uh, based on the 1984 film for Ghostbusters. Which was really originally written by Ivan Reitman. So this is basically the sequel to Ghostbusters, or at least the storyline that we originally received from Ghostbusters from 1984. So basically the first Ghostbusters going on to Ghostbusters 2, and this being the third film of that, I guess if anything, that storyline. So is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. Again, I know certain people might have thoughts on it, though some of them might be biased but we'll be going into that so as per usual I will have my segments of you know discussing certain parts of the film as well as giving my thoughts about certain you know aspects like let's say story character effects music and also to add to this lineup of topics of the movie controversy we'll be going step by step on my thoughts on the whole situation and to a certain degree kind of give my final thoughts by the very end of the, the review so with that being said and just so you guys know especially for the story segment there will be spoilers so I ask you guys to if you guys have not seen the film to go check it out but all in all with that being said, let's go ahead and talk about Ghostbusters Afterlife. So I want to quickly talk about controversy and unfortunately it more so dwells onto what has been happening or the controversy itself that has been presented with Ghostbusters 2016. And unfortunately, due to people, you know, forgive me, or if anything, forgive my French, uh, can't get their heads out of their asses and can't be objective or if anything, kind of understand criticism of a film, want to try to drag this film down because of the Ghostbusters name, especially since, since day one, people have been antagonizing the production of this or if anything antagonizing the credibility of this film there are so many and if you look at situations or at least in areas like Rotten Tomatoes people are very especially with certain reviews are very kind of self-centered or I guess if anything um, single-minded claiming that people will like this one because they didn't like the all girls reboot which I think I've stated in my my own review of Ghostbusters 2016 that I had no problem with the fact that again if for those who want to be subjective and I think mean, listen to another person's opinion I have no problem with the fact that there was an all-female cast is that the only thing I had a problem with is that they were boring not only that but boring knockoffs of previous characters that was the issue and not only that but a lot of them weren't even likable they weren't funny they weren't entertaining in fact the one that was supposed to be the knockoff of Egon was just so fucking annoying I didn't want to see her on screen and not only that but considering the fact that again and I have to quote myself on my previous film or film review of Ghostbusters 2016 I kind of sympathize with, to an extent, sympathize with the villain, or sympathize with the villain, sorry, 
because to an extent clearly you have a guy that is treated like shit i mean granted he's a shit villain but to an extent if there wasn't the ghost avenue he probably would have gone and shot up a school to an extent because again you have a guy who is awkward that's treated like shit why wouldn't he want to become a giant ghost monster to kill all, call, kill all of humanity granted again it's a bad villain but at the same time I can understand him but all in all the, the writing itself wasn't funny it just felt like a rehash of the first fucking movie which was another issue of the of altogether so to an extent especially with these people that want to claim that people like their argument is oh well, people love this because they hated the girl the girl ghostbusters go fuck yourselves i hate to be rude but seriously go fuck yourselves instead of like ha being in your own little echo chamber maybe take a look at why people didn't like the film now granted ghostbusters 1 and 2 have its own problems too but at the same time, especially with a, a, you know, when it comes to story, characters, etc., those movies were entertaining. Ghostbusters 2016, although it was an interesting take, especially with them trying to reboot the story, was not fun. It was not entertaining. The characters were boring. The villain itself was bad. And honestly, character actors that were in the original films felt wasted. So, all in all, it was a piss poor film. But unfortunately, again, people who were objective or, if anything, were very positive about that film because they wanted to give it that hype, wanted to try to tear this film down. Because, again, they can't get their heads out of their own fucking asses. So, at this point, it's. It's unfortunate because, again, you have that one movie that people wanted to defend. And when a movie, a follow-up, that isn't related to that storyline is set up, people are going to immediately hate it because, again, they have their own bias. I'm sorry, but that's not how it works. And if anything, before you pass judgment, you should actually watch the movie, which I'm sure a lot of these people didn't actually do. But enough about that. Let's go ahead and get on to the main meat of the film, or the, the review itself. And let's start with talking about the story. So as I said before, there probably will be store, uh, well, spoilers when it comes down to the movie itself. So. Uh, for those who have not seen it yet, uh, please go check it out. I'll be talking to some extent in depth of what happened. So, I guess the main synopsis of the film itself is, um, you know, a uh, parent and her two kids go to basically in the middle of nowhere to uncover um, the what's left or inherited of her uh, father who we find out is uh, Egon or uh, Spengler and eventually secrets start coming out that apparently Egon had uncovered which could cause or quite possibly cause the end of the world all in all this is uh, this is a this was a really interesting like I guess if anything a continuation of the story that we already got or have already been presented with and if I'm not counting the game which I believe came out in 2016 no not 2016 probably around 2010 2009 I believe just on the top of my head if I can remember which time period or time time or year that that came from um, I'm talking about the old Ghostbusters game where, to an extent, was a continuation of what story we've had for the movies. This would probably be the third 
iteration or segment of the story that we've gotten so far with Ghostbusters. And I will say that it kind of sets it up where there might be more than, I guess, if anything, if anything, creating a legacy of the Ghostbusters. And I'll get into that in a little bit. And to an extent, the way it's set up to is really cool. Where you have the parent who is clearly not like anything like Egon, though to an extent has problems with money, kind of like, you know, the guys or the, the original cast of the Ghostbusters, um, having trouble. And she finds, I guess it starts off with her actually, no, not even starting off with that. We have a moment where, uh, Egon, I think it's obviously Egon or somebody who is, you know, wearing Ghostbuster gear, uh, captures a ghost and proceeds to uh, hide it in the farmhouse that will be one of the sets for the movie. He's chased down by another ghost and to an extent is trying to activate a device which does not work and unfortunately that ends up causing his death. And going forward to that, we are introduced to the parent as well as the two kids, uh, which the parent is played by uh, Carrie Cohn, I believe. And the two kids, uh, Makina Grace and Finn Wolfhard are basically brought in to or at least brought into the middle of nowhere in order to uh, collect on their inheritance. Paul Rode as Mr. Groberson and to an extent finds out especially with another earthquake happening finds out that Paul Rode is or Mr. Gooberson is a uh, individual that tracks seismic activity. And right off the bat, they find out that apparently with no mining, fracking, or anything of the sort, no volcanoes, no tectonic plates, for some reason, a town that is basically has none of that is getting a ton of earthquakes. And the bigger question is why? So... They go to figure that out now periodically also and thanks and with the little uh little reader or ghost reader our character phoebe is approached by a ghost who shows her apparently the uh or this a uh, location for a trap which they show to paul rose character which unfortunately unleashes one of the initial uh, guardians of Gozer. If I would have to guess, it would probably be uh, the gatekeeper. I mean, we won't know. I mean, we don't know for sure, but all in all, it's just interesting. And as soon as that happens, all hell breaks loose. And throughout, like, at least till we get closer and closer to the end, it's our characters trying to figure out what's going on and learning more about their, their lineage. For instance, uh, Phoebe coming, a, a coming across a fire pole, which goes into uh, a underground laboratory, which has a lot of Egon's old tech, as well as a uh, proton pack, which she gets help from her grandfather to put back together and sure enough uh her and podcast end up testing it out and it's it's a pretty cool moment with her testing out the power the the proton pack and not only that but as soon as they were done testing it out they hear something in this uh foundry and it turns out it's a ghost which by the name by the way uh the, I guess the initial name for the ghost is called Muncher. 
And I'm not gonna lie, this is the cutest little thing I have ever seen when it comes to Ghostbusters. And it, it, to an extent, and by the way, Slimer doesn't show up at, in the movie at all. It would have been funny, but at the same time, I'm kind of glad they didn't put him in. Because then we get a new ghost. Um, that is kind of like the main main thing, that, or main one that we see. Um, besides, you know, the big bad near the very end. As well as the Guardians, uh, the Gatekeeper and the, uh, the Keymaster. But anyway, continuing forward, uh, we have this really cool segment where uh, Trevor, which is Finn Wolfhard's character, has been trying to fix Echo 1. He comes across Echo 1 and proceeds to try to uh, put it back together and drive it in the middle of a field. He then catches up to Podcast and Phoebe, and they proceed to try to catch the ghost. And in ghost -like, Ghostbusters fa uh, fashion, uh, proceed to destroy a ton of property. Which honestly, I think was probably the funniest moment. It's just just a staple of Ghostbusters, them just, just destroying a bunch of shit. <laughs> which I thought was funny. Um, especially with like, you see this, like people don't know what's going on. They see, you know, this proton, uh, the po proton stream proceeding to, I'm probably calling it, pro probably calling it what it's not supposed to be, but this, uh, the stream for the proton pack, there we go. Uh, basically destroying a bunch of like buildings and stuff. It's, it's, it's awesome. And then you see the ghost periodically, uh, skibbing through the buildings. In fact, one of the buildings, like right in between uh, Callie and Mr. Goberson having a date, which I thought was hilarious. Um, they do eventually end up catching the ghost, but un other than that, they end up getting ca caught by the cops, which everything, the Echo One, the Proton Back, everything gets impounded, including the ghost trap. Which, by the way, they actually implement or introduce a really cool new trap, which is basically a trap on RC, <laughs> and that thing is like really cool, especially with them like kind of doing a whole mobile thing, with uh like trying to catch this ghost you know on the road. So I thought I thought that was like really fucking cool, and yeah, they get they get arrested, everything gets getting impounded, and. To an extent, we also get, um, there's, by the way, spoilers, I mean, we're already talking about spoilers as well as giving my thoughts about the movie and the story, but to an extent, we, that, the Phoebe character ends up, uh, making a call, her one call in jail, and instead of calling her mom, she proceeds to call Ray. who, we kind of get a plot dump of what happened, like, why... All of a sudden, and apparently there's there's some resentment between uh, Ray, or Ray has some re resentment towards Egon, and I guess it's justified. Where apparently they explain that the reason that ghosts don't exist anymore, or they weren't catching ghosts anymore, was because apparently business was slow or was slowing down. Which I'm not gonna lie, that didn't make any sense. Because you know people die all the time. You're saying that it go like. Like ghosts stop popping up. That makes no sense at all. But yeah, they were trying to claim that oh, ghosts. I mean, it just started getting slower and slower. And the thing that I kind of, I kind of would understand is they talk about how Egon was discussing, or at least kind of mentioning the fact that there were these uh, ruins in these uh, mountains in a rural area that they didn't want to listen uh, listen about. So he basically stole all their shit. Uh, basically took Echo One, took you know, s you know, a ton of traps, a few proton packs, and basically, you know, left them in the dust. Which, to an extent, I can kind of understand the resentment there. Um, so, with that, she also mentions the fact that you know, Egon was you know, was dead and that she was, or at least tried to say that she was, uh, 
she was his gra uh, granddaughter. And unfortunately, the cop kind of abruptly ends the call and they get released. And after that, they start trying to uncover more information about what was going on with or what is Gozer. And sure enough, especially with, you know, again, especially with involving the key master and the uh, gatekeeper, it's and I'm not going to lie. I kind of figure this because in the trailers it doesn't it's not very subtle or doesn't hide the fact that Gozer returns and sure enough especially when at some point they end up going into these mines where some ruins are it turns out that again Gozer is coming back every every so often Gozer makes a return to cause massive harm to humanity and sure enough, and by the way, for if they have it set up where it's like 2021, which, <laughs> cool. Um, they realize that it's a, that they're in the year where Gozer are supposed to make their, make their comeback. So, and apparently the, the reason for the earthquakes, that's actually explained too. There's this, inside the ruins, there's this well that apparently starts periodically filling up and it turns out that inside it is either some kind of dimension or if anything a, a ghost more than likely Gozer and the reason that the earthquakes have been happening is because there's this trap that was set up by Egon before he died where if it starts to build up it has four protein uh, proton packs. I don't know why I said protein, but four proton packs that create that are lined up together in four designated locations that shoot a shoot all at once a consistent beam that is supposed to lower the pressure of this ghost anomaly and sure enough that explains you know the earthquakes because every time that this this whole thing occurs these proton packs of fire basically shooting down the ghost anomaly so at this point it's all it's all comes together that you know Egon knew the entire time what was going to happen and I think they kind of realized that what they set out, what they let loose, was kind of put in the in the trap in the first place. Now, I kind of sidestepped a little bit because there's actually a moment, uh, two moments too, which, you know, kind of like the first movie, we get a moment where people get possessed. Um, first of all, uh, Pawn Rhodes, uh, Paul Rhodes character, who's at a Walmart. And uh, we have this cute little moment with uh, tiny Stay Puff Marshmallow Men, which I thought was hilarious. And there's a moment where they're being, I, I, I think it's to, to an extent, I, I feel like this like a muffin time moment where they are basically killing each other, which I thought well, it's it's funny because, you know, you have these little marshmallow men that are just happy go lucky and just like freaking turning on a grill or like a barbecue and proceeding to melt themselves. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> I had to laugh. I, it's horrible to laugh, but at the same time it was funny. And there's, there's actually a really, uh, really cool. Uh, if you, if you're not paying attention, you notice one of them that walks onto the grill and as it's being melted proceeds to hold a thumbs up, uh, kind of reminiscent to Terminator, which I thought was hilarious. Um, but anyways, after this whole freak show with the Mar uh, Stay Puft Marshmallow Men, uh, Paul Rhodes' character comes across one of the Guardians, who is, I think, 
I think it's I think I'm gonna say it best it was the I mean obviously obviously because usually it seems like the male character is the one that becomes this uh, the key master and that thing chases him and possesses him and we don't see him till like closer to the end but after that we have another moment where uh, Carrie Coon's character, or Callie, is kind of uh, sent to the secret laboratory. And the entire movie, this character has had resentment towards Egon. And kind of felt like this character, or her character, was abandoned by him a while, or like way long ago. And it turns out that. Even though he left, he still thought of her. The and which again, it, it's it's odd. It is so fucking odd that we get to see um, Egon in a different light, where he apparently, um, best way to put it, had offspring and had kids, and they had their own kids, and he was granddad. So again, it just with him being such an awkward character, it's just so weird. I would never expect Egon to do that. But anyway, going further, uh, she finds out that he did care, that he always fought of her, but that sentiment is kind of short lived because she ends up getting possessed by, uh, by Zul. And, uh, with you both the key master and the gatekeeper being possessed or possessing a human host they proceed to you know come together to you know start the apocalypse or kickstart the the apocalypse so with that the ruins under the town of uh Shandor or Somerville which by the way it it says it bet when I when I found out that you know the mines are literally called Shandor or named after Shandor I kind of figured, like, right off the bat, okay, yeah, this is another freaking Gozer thing. Once again, even though I know from the trailer, but all in all, it was it was cool. Also, apparently, Shandor preserved himself in the bottom of uh, the chasm where the ruins are. And during this whole procedure, Gozer gets uh, resurrected, which kind of having the same like a more updated version of their original look before they become stay puff and i i'm not gonna lie i'm pretty sure they got the original voice actor or actress to do the gozer voice because all in all it was actually really freaking good it it, it was like it was how should i put this it was unsettling very very unsettling but all in all it was like a great how should I put this like it was it was nostalgic to some de to, to some degree so anyways Gozer's resurrected the kids find out that apparently this device that um that Egon had created was a basically a super trap that was designed or at least created to help capture Gozer so they end up trying to figure out a way or at least kind of coming up with a way to get Gozer over there sure enough they have a good plan which I, I, I thought it was great with you see each and every one of the characters uh, suiting up Grabbing all of the spare uh, jumpsuits that Egon had to uh, go against Gozer, which I thought again, it, it's cool, it's iconic, I love it. Um, they proceed to go there, and kind of a running gag. I haven't talked about this yet, but kind of a running gag that's been going on with uh, with one of the characters, Phoebe, especially with you know with her being kind of like kind of mirroring Egon, where she is kind of awkward. Um, and as well as being a scientist, 
she does this thing where she tells jokes and they're really really bad jokes and it's just been a running gag throughout the entire film and it kind of goes full circle where you see Gozer sitting on their throne and eventually or inevitably you see Phoebe getting a like basically walking up to Gozer and starts telling jokes and trying to you know distract her while you see the little RC trap getting under what what, what is to be the uh, gatekeeper and I like this kind of quick line from uh, from or this kind of interaction between Gozer and Phoebe where um, Gozer's like are you ready to die and Phoebe's like no I'm 12 are you and they activate the trap basically entrapping the spirit of the gatekeeper or Zool rescuing Phoebe and Trevor's mom they all get out of there and to an extent Gozer is weakened because she needs both the gatekeeper and the keymaster to have her full strength so they take Gozer or not Gozer but Zul and proceed to try and get back to the farmhouse which they do and to an extent they prepare for the worst and sure enough Gozer who's slightly weakened proceeds to try to walk onto the land or onto the farm by which they try to power the the trap but unfortunately it's not working they try using a couple of the the proton packs but unfortunately it's not uh, that doesn't work either in fact inevitably uh, they end up losing or at least losing I guess a hold of uh, Zool by which Gozer proceeds to break Zool out of the trap and Zool ends up capturing Lucky who is uh, I guess if anything the female um, motivation to the Trevor character and inevitably it seems like all hope is lost but to an extent a really cool like awesome moment is when we see old man Ray old man Peter and old man Winston show up out of nowhere in their jumpsuits and proton packs and basically are ready to kick some ass uh Dan Aykroyd doing this like really cool monologue which is reminiscent to the first movie um you know kind of going over a lot of like you know as a member of this society this and that that we ask you to leave this plane of existence um Peter played by Bill uh, reprised by Bill Murray is kind of like making fun of him to that extent Winston kind of cracking a joke that you know Gozer might remember remember them which I'm sure they I'm sure Gozer probably does <laughs> and by the way there's actually a really funny callback um from the first movie where um Gozer goes are you a god and for a second and this was so funny Dan uh, Dan Aykroyd's character uh Ray or Raymond Stance uh, is about to answer the question and Bill and Winston are like or Peter and Winston are like dude no because you know like come on guys come on don't do it and he goes yes now for those who don't who have not watched the first movie there's a really funny bit where Gozer asks Ray are you a god and he says no and goes just like then die and proceeds to try to like electrocute them off a roof which i guess at this point they did learn their lesson not to say no when asked that particular question but lo and behold they're ready to kick some ass and proceed to try to activate their 
proton packs and zap gozer not only that but doing the thing that would get them all killed and crossing the stream which we've been told many times that that's bad you don't do that but apparently that has no effect either not this time around anyway because gozer just kind of shakes it off and proceeds to fling Peter, Ray, and Winston in the air, knocking them on their asses. Which we get a funny line where I think I believe from Trevor where he's like, Oh, are they dead? <laughs> which sure enough, no, they're not. So inevitably they end up trying again. And we also have Phoebe. Actually, no, we I mean to kind of end this this fight. It starts off with Phoebe kind of taking on Gozer by herself, with Gozer using her power to deflect the the stream from the proton pack. By which we also get Peter, Ray, and Winston also assisting them with that. Now another thing too that also happens is the ghost of uh, Egon pops up in a full body apparition which I thought was pretty cool um now something I, I mean I think it's more of like because you know the actor's dead um the character doesn't talk throughout like the last bit of the movie and um probably I think I think to an extent kind of sets it up where the characters you know I mean when it comes to ghosts they can't talk period I don't know but either way, it was it, it, it's an interesting thing, which to an extent I think it would it, it makes it easier for the the actor to you know not try to mimic the voice for Ray or not Ray but uh, Egon. But all in all, uh, basically Egon, going further, Egon is assisting his granddaughter. We have Ray, Peter, and Winston also using their proton backs to push back Gozer and Trevor who has the proton pack hooked up to the Echo 1 gets it working because at some point we had little Marshmallow Man proceeding to try to destroy the Echo 1 um, he gets his working but instead of trying to hit Gozer he proceeds to uh, basically charge up these pylons that were causing problems with you know I mean energy wise to activate the trap so he powers up the pylons and inevitably Callie who is closest to the trigger proceeds to activate the trap and we get this really cool visual where all these traps under under the field that were on Egon's property proceed to open up and we see a bunch of ghosts being pulled in and literally Gozer being ripped apart as she's being or as they are being trapped inside this multitude of traps. And honestly, it's a cool visual. We have a and after that, after the dust is settled, we have a very touching moment with, um, I guess, the final moments of Egon and his family. As we watch as he basically, you know, with him kind of completing his purpose, kind of, you know, going wherever he needs to go now. And the movie ends with that. But we do end up getting two end credit scenes. Which I gotta say, I gotta I did not expect for this Ghostbusters movie. But all in all, I'm really happy for it. Um, I guess if anything to talk about Ghostbusters, the first the first end credit scene. This is in between the credits where we see kind of rem reminiscent to the first movie. We have uh, Peter hooked up to electrodes and the electric box that he was using to shock his, his students. And we have Sigourney Weaver for her only scene in the film uh, testing him in his psychic prowess and sure enough he's getting every, everything wrong or everything right but 
when it comes to being questioned is continuously electrocuted. And it turns out to an extent kind of to an extent kind of knows that, you know, how much he's really kind of messed with people to a certain degree. And in turn of, you know, him getting every card, right. It turns out that he, it's not because he was psychic, but he marked the cards, which I thought was hilarious, which is, is a total Peter thing. Sure enough. He electrocutes him for that too. (laughs) I mean, I think if anything, that the whole scene was for comedic value. Now the final scene or final end credit scene, I, I want to be hopeful because I think it sets something up. And if anything, I think it's more of, I think as an homage to what Ghost Ghostbusters has been, especially for a lot of people. And it, it's a, it basically the scene is set up with, uh, with Janine talking to Winston, talking about, um, legacy or talking about how Winston has grown as a character because one detail that I failed to mention is they talk about some of the things that uh, you know the other Ghostbusters have done uh, Peter Vekman does courses or at least runs or teaches courses in college Ray has a uh, antique shop or if anything a not an antique shop, but more so of like rare and uh, just rare items. And Winston has become a full on businessman. And he talks about legacy in a very interesting way, especially with talking about like where he came from that, you know, no matter what, no matter, you know, well, no matter how much of a businessman he is, he's always Ghostbuster. And the, movie or at least the last scene ends with him entering the firehouse you know the tri- the the original firehouse and bringing in echo one which i thought was a really cool scene but it doesn't end there it ends with the the storage facility that was used to collect all the ghosts and that it's was beeping and causing a lot of noise so I kind of feel like that's setting something up especially with what we've seen so far when it comes down to you know our characters and what we deal what they deal with so all in all now final thoughts about the story I think it was done extremely well especially since you know there is that gap between you know the second film I think if anything they probably forgot about the second film so I guess if anything the first film and this current film and it kind of shows where our characters have been and what they've gone through to a certain degree if only briefly for a few of them but when it comes down to Egon and him kind of creating this legacy for his own uh, family as well as kind of trying to protect them from the worst. It just, honestly, it was a really good way, like really good story to follow. But I, I'm, I'm still weirded out about Egon, you know, having kids and, you know, having grandkids. And all in all, it's just, I guess if anything, and I, I know I'm going to sound like a fanboy. I'm sure a lot of people will think I'm being, I'm not being objective enough or if anything, I'm kind of being biased. All in all, it, it, honestly, whether I'm a, Go- a Ghostbusters fan, fan or not, the story itself was was done well. And I like this continuation of it being like to the next generation of Ghostbusters. Or if anything, following the, the footsteps of others to a certain degree. But I will say I kind of wish that they would have had a different villain. But... Let's. I'm gonna be fair here, especially when it comes down to villains. They tried having a different villain for Ghostbusters 2, that being uh, with Vigo, and for a lot of people that did not work so well. And it kind of makes sense at this point that 
every so often, especially when it comes to the media involving Ghostbusters, the big bad has always been anything involving Go Gozer or uh, Gozer or Shandor. So all in all, story itself, I had no problems with. I will say that it was again. It was it, it was interesting. It was an interesting story, and I loved it. It had its moments where it needed to be serious, had its moments to be fun, and when it got to the point where it needed to get busy, it was done extremely well. So, all right. When it comes down to characters, I want to quickly get these couple out of the way and talk about the old guys, the original, the OGs of Ghostbusters. I guess if anything, Bill Murray, always as funny as ever, playing as uh, Peter Beckman. Uh, Dan Aykroyd, playing as Ray Stance, again, as funny as he was, especially when it comes down to his uh, dialogue. And to an extent, again, with how short his, with how short of a cameo we get to see of them, uh, him doing his little monologue when facing uh, Gozer, I thought was really fun. Winston, kind of being like, to an extent, kind of being like the cool guy of the group. Then again, that can be said with Peter too. Uh, has his a couple of lines that was really good, and I guess is really done well for himself through the time skip. So all in all. It, it just it's nice to see you know each and every one of these characters reprising their roles as well as Sigourney Weaver even though she got again like a couple of minutes of screen time it was nice seeing her character again as well as Janine who we got to see a couple of times uh, who again is played by Annie Potts um, now going further than that uh, talking about some of the main characters uh, Finn Rolfhard playing Trevor was entertaining um, kind of playing as this awkward teenager who wants to fit in to a certain degree and basically has to lie in one segment in order to get a job and kind of be close to this one girl named Lucky played by Sieste O'Connor or Celeste O'Connor. Uh, McKenny Grace playing Phoebe or I guess Egon 2.0 I thought was really great. And it's not. And it was interesting that the main focus was on her, which honestly I did not. I know some people might have an issue with that, because a lot of people will classify her as a Mary Sue. But honestly, I. I can kind of see that, but at the same time, that wasn't my main focus. Or if anything, I didn't have a problem with it. I thought it was interesting, but it wasn't the main thing that I focused on. More so, you know, with her, I guess, again, with them, you know, fighting ghosts. That was my main focus of the entire film. Uh, we have Logan Kim playing the character podcast, which I thought was honestly hilarious when he's on screen. Um, and apparently he does, he, he uh, like, they set it up where this kid does podcasts. And he has, like, one subscriber. And it turns out that that's uh, Ray or Ray Stance that's the subscriber which I thought was hilarious I thought that was like a really cool like kind of thing to end with with their characters uh Carrie Coon playing as the mom who is basically dealing with a lot of shit um near the beginning of the movie is really great kind of uh, as somebody who is to an extent is trying to keep everything together but is having such a hard time doing it which I can kind of understand to a very good degree. Uh, Paul Road playing uh, Mr. Groberson, which I thought of was hilarious. Now, I'm not going to lie. It threw me off with the beard with him. And I, it, to be perfectly honest, there's a couple of scenes where he's positioned. I think more so with like the... Uh, the scenes in Walmart where I'm not gonna lie with how it how he looks or the direction of the camera he almost looks like uh, Benedict Cumberbatch with the beard I thought it was hilarious 
Um, but all in all, his moments were actually really good too. And above all, it's just, I guess if anything, like that's all I have to say about characters. Um, each and every one of them played their roles really well. And I absolutely love them as, you know, in this movie. Really do. So, I'm not going to lie, I don't think there's much I can really say about effects. Because honestly, the effects, especially when it comes down to what we got to see for the original films going on to like now, especially with the technology we have now when it comes down to uh, movie making, is done surprisingly well. And it was really cool to see, especially when it comes down to updated designs or updated effects for a lot of the things we've seen for Ghostbusters, especially for the proton packs. The imagery that we see for the, sh like, the proton packs weaponry or the, I guess if anything, like the streams used or emitted from the proton packs look really cool. Uh, one of the only ghosts that we see in CG, which is the Muncher. Gosh, I fuck, I, I freaking love this little, this little ghost. I honestly, he, he he's probably my favorite right now. And there's a really funny moment with him where uh, our characters, Phoebe, Trevor, and Podcast are in Echo One, chasing him down in the middle of town, and he's all munching on a fire hydrant, and he hears them approaching. And he looks up and kind of gives a little, like, has these little puppy dog eyes. And kind of like, gives a little, like, puppy dog moan. And I thought it was really funny and really cute. And the imagery that we see, especially when it comes down to uh, camera work, effects, and so on, especially for moments like that, is done surprisingly well. And I love it. I absolutely love it. As well as what we've gotten to see for our characters or especially and actually it sent before I forget there was really cool effects like with smoke or I'm assuming digital effects when it comes to smoke as well as uh, one of the guardian characters or the guardian ghosts whatever they use is is, is it, it's intriguing it really is and I gotta say, it's probably one of the best things I've seen. Um, not to kind of over-exaggerate, all in all, it looks really, really good. And I loved it. Hell, going further than that, briefly talking about Gozer, I like the new updated look for Gozer. It sticks to, or somewhat sticks to the iconic look. But if you notice, especially like kind of comparing the two, Gozer's costume in the original looked just looked like a costume, but in this movie for Afterlife, it doesn't look like a costume at all or a suit, if anything. It looks the way that she looks or they look is more organic, which I gotta say, whoever did the costume work for this or the concept art for this is, you know, just a plus, a plus effort. As well as the update designs, or at least kind of the more realistic designs for Goes or for the uh, the Guardians, it looks really good. Which, by the way, speaking of you know looks when it comes down to this film, I want to briefly talk about Egon's uh, reappearance in the movie, where I'm going to assume they use digital effects. I mean, obviously use dig digital effects to map. Egon's or uh, Harold Ramis's face onto the actor that they used for Egon, which to an extent is, I, I, I know I keep saying it's done very well, it's done exceptionally, especially with you know him being in ghost form as well. All in all, I, I mean, his look, especially with what we see briefly, is excellent, above all, excellent. Okay, so talking about music. Now, there's... I know I keep saying there's not a lot to talk about, but this is going to be brief. 
so main score for the film was uh, composed by Rob Simonson. And if there's one thing I can say about the music itself for Ghostbusters Afterlife, it's iconic. Or if anything, it's nostalgic. There is a lot of score, I, I guess if anything, notes from the original score that are placed in this film that just fit perfectly to its tone, especially when it comes to certain segments of the movie. I will say that to an extent, it, or at least to a major extent, the filmmakers decided to not resort to music or try to use music that didn't fit well with the flow of the film, or if anything, music genres that just didn't belong in this particular movie. But above all, the music itself is iconic, it's, it's memorable. And it really kind of takes you back to what we've seen previously in, or at least if anything, have heard in recent years or if anything back in the day when Ghostbusters was first or originally created. Okay, so final thoughts of my review story itself I had no problems with at this point it's a story that follows legacy or if anything the next generation of you know people that started it all characters as well as the actors that play them I had no issues with to an extent I think they did their jobs uh, or at least when it comes to their acting did their jobs adequately when it comes down to effects, it's I like the updated versions of you know a lot of the stuff that we've seen previously and or at least in previous films when it comes down to you know iconic stuff involving the Ghostbusters, as well as some of the visual or other like effects or digital effects that we see. Uh, two of my favorites are probably going to be, if anything, again, the Muncher. And the Stay Puff Marshmallow Mini Men. <laughs> Those two segments were really great for me. As well as, actually, if anything, if I were to add two more, uh, adding the new design or the updated design of Gozer and the last cameo, or if anything, I, I don't know if I can classify it as cameo, but if anything, the brief moment where we see a version of. Uh, Harold Ramis. Music itself is iconic and if anything just kind of really helps your nostalgia. So with that being said I know I've talked very positively about this and I know that at least for the very beginning of this video I talked briefly about the controversy which I'm, I'm gonna be perfectly honest I'm not going to mark it up to support, to just kind of, because I don't want people to think I'm biased. I'm not going to give an extra point because of the controversy. I'm not going to take a point away. Because at this point, especially when it comes down to the controversy segment that I've mentioned, this is more so, it's not, I don't blame the film for this. I blame the people that at this point can't let some of their bias go. So, with that being said, for my review of Ghostbusters Afterlife, I'm going to give this a 10 out of 10. Honestly, I enjoyed this film. For those who are very nostalgic for the Ghostbusters, I think they'll enjoy it as well. Especially when, again, this is a story that follows the next generation. All in all, it was a good film and I enjoyed it. And with that, that is the end of my review of Ghostbusters Afterlife. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys can, uh, please leave a like, comment, share, subscribe, all the good stuff. If you guys want to follow us on social media, links are in the description down below. As well as check out our daily content and the weekly podcast. With that being said, this is Rob Novacast setting off. Have a good one, take care, and I will see you guys in the next video.